Thank you for joining me this morning. We've got about 20, 25 minutes to go through what I've called sort of back to basics. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll talk about it as we go through, obviously, but I think it's really around what are the foundations that we need in our industry to make sure that we can take advantage of the technology that's already with us. One of the reasons, one of the, the, the sort of origins of how this came about was I've had so many clients say to me, oh, well, it's okay because we'll use something that can actually deliver the same sort of service and the same sort of uh, result. You think, well, okay, we could do that, whether it's an app or a, a mobile device. But if we don't actually understand the basics of why we're doing that and what it is that we actually want to get as a result, then we're not likely to be very successful in what we want to do. So very, very quickly, just about me, just pay the bills as it were. Um, as Gary said, partner at RLB, Chancellor of Heaven Survey, which I'm very, very proud about. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. I've got an operation consultancy background. And we're talking about back to basics. Just a Palace fan, so if ever there's a back to basics for that, everyone says, oh, well, you know, okay, let me go up. No, no, you really can, you can go down. About a year ago, about, about 18 months ago, I spoke at one of these events where we talked around, I, I was talking about six things that I think facilities managers need to consider to be successful, to think about the future. And just a quick recap on that, because I think they're very relevant to what we're talking about today. So the first one of those was value and well-being value and well-being in the workplace of our, our employers, our customers, FM influence on design of buildings and structures. It came up in the opening panel today. I would hope that no one really doubts the importance of that. It's not always happens, as we know, but we are seeing more and more examples of that coming to the fore now. The ability to bridge across industry standards and disciplines. If I'm honest, I think if we sort of look back and, and sort of take a bit of a look in the mirror, we haven't been very good at that. Because what I mean by that is what are the other sectors, what are the other industries that are doing, whether it's engineering, whether it's architecture, how are they influencing FM, influencing FM? And what are we doing about it? What are we learning from them? Expertise in the management of data, again, that came up in the opening panel this morning. I think that's absolutely fundamental. We have got some great examples in our industry of that. It is not yet uniform. And why is that? Why are we not better at doing that? Putting employees at the heart of FM strategy, there's been a huge amount about that in the last year. Could be more than that, actually, how important that is. And not just in the FM sector. Again, it's not just thinking about, oh, well, if it's in the FM world or, or PFM or whatever those magazines are, but it's other sectors and other industries that are also talking about that. I don't think anyone would disagree with that necessarily either. And stakeholder consultation and involvement. And that's not just across our peer groups and our customers. That's also thinking about, again, what are other people doing to do with our industry and related to our industry that is so important in the workplace and the impacts of, um, that, that we can have in doing our jobs. And just very quickly, there isn't one of these. There is no silver bullet. I have been asked before, well, what can we do? What's the one project that we can do that will help us? Well, it's not necessarily one project to get to where we want to be. We've got to actually understand what those objectives are and what the plan is. But there is no, unfortunately, there is no panacea to all our wheels. So what do we mean to show my age here, shapeshifters? Back to basics. What do we mean by back to basics? I think, I think as I was saying at the start, it's really around thinking about the fundamental foundations of what we need for training and education. But what's aligned with that? How do we grow and develop that as we go through our careers? And we're at a disadvantage. I think you probably all know this. Other sectors, other parts of our sectors, whether it's surveying, Right, I'm a chartered surveyor, but chartered FM surveyor, uh, whether it's surveying, whether it's engineering, whether it's architecture, very clear structured training program all the way from A-levels all the way through, and people can see that. They can see other examples of where people have been successful by following that. We don't have that. So what do we actually mean by the foundations that we need? So first off, could all do with one of these sometimes. Suit of armour. What do I mean by a suit of armour? This is our protection. This is the fundamental technical standards that are identifiable <clears throat> and that are fundamental to how we succeed in what we want to do in our, in our careers. So it's the qualifications. And we use this because, or well, we need this rather, because we will be challenged. As we go through our careers, whether it's at the start, middle, the end, we're going to be challenged around what we think is the right thing to do. How can we actually stand there and say to people, you need to listen to me unless we can base that on some really clear structured training and qualifications. But it's not just a suit of armour. 
we know that people build, a wall, uh, build walls around what we do, where we are and what they do, and we need something to be able to break through those walls, a battering ram. Actually, I think, and I'll talk about it in a minute, I think this is where the softer skills, which we are really good at, will break down those walls so that we actually start to have more influence that we, than we currently have now, because I'm absolutely fundamentally, I'm passionate about the fact that we should have more influence on what, um, how our workplaces are designed and how they're used, but we still don't have that, that, that level of influence that I think we should have. And I know this is absolutely, uh, you know, you've all heard it before, I know, but we do have to have that strategic vision, and we're not very good at it. Hopefully some of you may disagree with that and say, actually, no, I'm really good at that, and I do that. I've got a really, really strong strategic vision, and I know where we're going with our organisation. Great, excellent. It's not always in my experience. It's too day-to-day, -day. and I know this is a bit of a cliché, but without that, we're not really going to be successful in what we do. So, all right, going back to that suit of armour, going back to those qualifications, let's just think about some of those technical, technical areas that we need to, to focus on. There are others, but this is, I think, is probably the best example in our industry of a structured training programme, certainly in the UK anyway, for facilities management. And it's the BIFM one, so I'm flying the flag for them today. Yes, I do a lot with BIFM, but there are others I'm going to talk about in a minute. You can't necessarily see the detail on the, um, on the right-hand side there, but that, hopefully some of you recognise that, that's a structured training programme right from the bottom, which is where you have a certificate in FM, whether you're an apprentice or whether you're just joining the industry, don't know anything about FM, all the way up to the top, level seven, that master's degree <coughs> of um, uh, showing that, that strategic leader competence level. If you take that away, say we didn't have that, there isn't anything else that I can think of that maps a clear career path. So absolutely great that we've got that. How many of us have either been on it and been through it? Perhaps not many at the moment because it is relatively new. Are we making sure that the people who are joining our organisations and our, our sector really are going through this development programme? And I don't think that's necessarily happening. It needs to happen more. I said that we would actually be talking about, you know, I'll be talking about others. And there are, of course, others that provide this sort of training. RICS and now the affiliation with IFMA. And you probably all know that um, it's the APC, the Assessment of Professional Competence. Which for the RICS, in terms of a lot of surveying, as we know, is a, what they call the gold standard. It's recognised around the world. How do we as FM get into that? It's not very easy. I did it, but I was, what, 32, 33? Not 21. So I think that's fundamentally an area where, where there's a gap. But go back to that structured training, and that starts to fill that in. And there are, of course, lots of degree courses, but that's the fundamental issue again, you see. How do you start at a degree level? So if you have your technical training and technical competences in place, you've gone through that structured training programme. We need to think further afield, though. What are other sectors and other companies doing, or other organisations doing, around facilities management? And again, I, my experience when I engage with clients is that they don't necessarily know about these things. And you think, well, no, there, there's some really good stuff here. SIBSI, the Chartered Institute of Building, Surveying and Engineering, they have a facilities management group. They have an FM group, which gives some really, really good information, including this, obviously, hopefully some of you may recognise this. You may be using it, SIBSI Guide M, recently been done, 2014, I think, was rewritten. <coughs> the great thing about this, just quickly, is that it's clearly written, and you can understand it if you're not an engineer. And I think that is a fundamental... Um, problem with some of the guidance in our, in, in our world of work is you need to have some specialist expertise to be able to interpret it. But not that, I think that's pretty easy to pick up and understand it. And it clearly takes you through what you need to understand to be able to manage the built assets and built environment. And indeed the, the SIBSI life values at the back uh, are used in lots of projects where you need to understand the um, life cycle replacement values. And SIBSI do a lot of CPD training as well. They do a lot of uh, course and events where um, you can go along and it's free. This is facilities management, though. And so I go along to these, most of the ones in London, because it's easier for me. But I don't find many people from FM there. I find engineers who need to know about FM. And there is the Chartered Institute of Building. And you think, well, that's building stuff, isn't it? That's construction. You know, That's fundamentally the problem, isn't it? Because they're building stuff, but they don't understand FM. But they do have an area on their website, and they do have a sector within their group that actually focuses on FM. And they produce a contract. They produce one of the very few contracts in our world of work, which is for FM. Now, there are, there are problems with that contract. So I'm quite open about that. 
you need to do a lot of development work to make it work for you. It's actually, originally it was quite old, it was rewritten two or three years ago, can't remember now, by Cameron McKenna. But they at least have a contract that represents our sector. We don't have that. There is a, a different presentation I could do at some point, where I think we should have one. We don't have one at the moment. The Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply. Well, that's buying stuff, isn't it? It's transactional. It's purely just buying stuff, commercial management. Well, no. They've got facilities management group as well. And they're actually affiliated with BIFM. They're doing a lot of work with BIFM. I don't know if that's an official affiliation, by the way, but they're certainly doing a lot of work. I sit on the special interest group for procurement for BIFM, and we're doing quite a lot of work there. There is a lady who sits on our panel who is a SIPS member, as in working for SIPS. Then you've got to think about the cross-border issues. There is EuroFM giving the research and practice, because it's not just UK. You've got Global FM, who pull together lots of global organisations who, um, who represent FM as an industry. And, of course, you've got World FM Day, which some of you may well have been involved in, um, and, and I was proud to say that I was as well, which are trying to represent what FM is doing around the world. So what's the point of all of this? Well, the point is, is if you go back to think about those building blocks to do our technical training, to do our education, you also need to think about this to really have that wider knowledge, to have that influence on other people in our sector. It's easy to access. Just very quickly, this, uh, I, I was trying to, for this presentation, I was trying to find a map of all global organisations that represent FM. I couldn't find one. So if anyone knows of one, please do get in touch because that would be really, really useful. But this was done by a company called CIFMERS, CF Merth, and the orange areas are the areas where they have identified there is a, an established representative body for FM. You think, all right, OK, good. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, understood. Why isn't it all orange? FM is being done everywhere, particularly in the developed world anyway. Why do we not have representation everywhere? Something for us to think about, I think. Then... There are the themes that we need to be experts in, or we at least need to have to access to expertise, sustainability and sustainable development goals. And, and most of us in the room, if we're involved in FM, will have been involved in this at some point, whether it's energy. But we're not sustainable experts. We're not necessarily energy or environmental experts. And yet we need to be able to tap into that. We need to know the standards that are involved. There's health and safety. Absolutely essential for us to know that. We need to know what the HSE means if they knock on our door and what they want. We have to know about the legislation involved. We have to know about contracts. We have to know about legislation. We have to be able to understand the different aspects that, um, that determine a contract. Or you at least have to know who in your organisation will help you with this. Now, that in itself can be a problem because they'll know perhaps about how to put a contract together. But they won't necessarily know the service elements, the, um, the, what, what you need out of it as an FM provider to get a good service out of the contract. And of course procurement now is absolutely essential for us to know, obviously I would say that, a bit of a bias in that, but it's more global, it's more computer based, it's more digital, there are more portals out there, which one to use, which frameworks. Data security, <coughs> excuse me, data security, hugely important as we get more and more technology overlapping. But if we're going to get more and more technology um, ability, uh, capability in our organisations and the service providers coming to us and saying, look what we can do with all of this. We have to know about this. We have to know about the fact that there's a, an ISO 27001. We have to know about the GDPR. Data Protection Act is on its way out, 22nd of May next year. We've got the General Data Protection Regulation coming in. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? What does that mean for what should we expect from our service providers who are who are also perhaps controlling our information, controlling our data. Was it last week? Was it the weekend? We had that issue around the leak of the uh, huge leak in Bermuda around information. It's not to do with FM, but it is a data leak. And so how might that impact us? And of course, we had the problems in NHS as well. We need to know about ISO standards. We need to know about what the um, effect of this is. When we write it in a contract, we write it in a specification, we say, you must comply with. What does that mean? How do we check? How do we know? We need to know about British standards. And I think this is the, the trick in FM. If we think again about those, those building blocks and back to basics, and what are the basics that we need? We need to know where the answer is. We might not necessarily know what the answer is. I don't know every word of all of these standards, but I know what these standards apply to, and I know when it might need to, to be uh, referred to. And when I write it in a specification for a client, I know what I should see in terms of a return for a, a tender response. And just very, very quickly, I'm going to refer back to my notes here, because this is the, 
third report from RICS on raising the bar, strategic influence. And here it is. And if you haven't read them, there's three of them, as I say. Um, these are fantastic examples of where FM is being pushed into that strategic area. Um, not enough, I would say, but it is going in that direction. And these are some really, really good, good examples in there. But the point I was going to make from this one is around demographic of our sector. A bit alarming, I would say. Now, it's only RICS, and I know that's not necessarily representative of our entire sector, but it's part of it. So, there are more RICS FM members over 70 than under 30. Crikey. There is less, well, there are less than 15% of members, RICS members, FM, are under 40. 50, one five, 15% under 40. No, I'm not one of them. So you think, right, okay. Now, this isn't an issue just for us. I get that. It's construction. It's other industries as well. There's a demographic around bringing, or a demographic issue around bringing people through who are particularly uh, well-trained and well-qualified and, and, and making sure that the people at the top leave that legacy behind. But it's still an alarming issue, I think. I don't think we are. And what I mean by that is, are we ready to have all of this technology come on and, and solve all our ills and make... Make, allow us to go forward and actually be the influential people that we, uh, we want to be in our workplace. Some of you will be. I get that. I think one of the problems with some of these presentations is we're talking to people who actually have had that influence and have actually done that preparation. But I go into a lot of organisations, whether it's public or private or wherever it might be, they're not ready. They're not ready. All right, OK, so three things then, three things, we doing for time, quickly, that I think... If we've got all of that technical stuff and we've looked, looked at all the different industry bodies and we understand what they're doing as our fundamental basis, what are the three things that I would pull out and say, look, you've really got to get this right? I'm afraid I couldn't find a, a nice image for that, so I've just put the words up. High quality data. It was mentioned at the um, opening panel this morning around the importance of information, asset management information. And I'm not just talking about the built environment and assets and M&E, but of course that is where it normally relates to. You just cannot underscore this enough. You have to have, at least good, but I would say high quality data in an organisation. I've yet to come across any organisation or any company where that's difficult to get to. Actually doing it is easy. Influencing people as to why you need to do it, that's hard. But getting this information is very straightforward. So you don't need to read that. This is that the point of putting that up is it's a spreadsheet. It's an Excel spreadsheet that says, look... This is based on standard, BS8544, which says, look, if you're going to go out and do this, get this information in, because it's going to give you some real good quality data out of it. But you can just about see there's a red strand at the top there, red ribbon up there. I've said to the organisation I'm working with, this is current work at the moment, if you don't get anything else, get those. Because if you get this information, then you can start producing stuff like this. And that's not only useful to you, that's useful to the people that you're trying to persuade the argument of and it defends you, back to that suit of armour again, it defends you in terms of uh, challenges and in terms of other people taking more space and more airtime and influencing design and influencing the workspace. Transparency. So I don't mean being see-through. I don't mean being opaque and, and easy to read. It's absolutely critical, I would say, as, as, a, as a whole, across all of our sector, that we aim to be as transparent as possible. What do I mean by that? The full, accurate and timely disclosure of information. It would be amazing if everyone we worked with did that and how it could actually change things. The full, accurate and timely disclosure of information. But that's what we should aim for and that's where we should be going with that. Strategic view. I'm not going to dwell on strategic view. Everyone knows that we should be more strategic. But the point of this is, if we're not doing this, if we're not coming up and looking down... How can we actually influence how we move those pieces around and we suggest to other people, look, you should actually follow my lead and follow these things and follow, follow my, uh, my, my strategic implementation. We won't know what the effect on the other parts are. And I know this sounds really simple, but we have to know money. We have to be good at finance, good enough anyway, to actually run an FM operation. And again, perhaps a lot of you in this room probably are. It's not always the case. It's not always the case in FM where you go into an organisation, you speak to the facilities manager with a contract manager who, who runs FM and you say, I'll tell you what, we need to do a refit, do a refurb, go and do me a business case, a business plan. 
And then suddenly someone like me is wheeled in just to help them with that. It's, it's, simple, it's straightforward stuff. And I'm not being condescending. I just mean that it actually really does need to be a fundamental aspect to how we actually, um, <clears throat> how we work and how we influence our peer groups. And we should be looking at, uh, sorry, we shouldn't be scared at all of actually getting involved in some quite detailed finance projects, financial project, project models, rather. Otherwise, we end up doing this. And we are the blind leading the blinds. And I've actually had a client say to, them, say to me recently, was saying, well, actually, I think we probably are with the blind leading. Well, that, that's no good. This is where we need to be. Oh, that comes up really blue. Didn't come up blue earlier. So we need to be that trusted workspace partner. All right, so trying to pull all of that together then, in terms of what I've spoken about already this morning, these, I think, are the building blocks. There may be others, but I think these are absolutely fundamental. So we've got on the left-hand side there our technical training, and you can't necessarily read what it says in the scrolls. There's apprenticeships. I mentioned that already. Apprenticeships, absolutely essential for us to actually push that through our industry, but it's not something that's going to get us to where we need to be, but it's a good start. We've got the BIFM level 1 to 7. We've got the RICS APC. We've got degree courses. We've got that technical training side of it. We've got the standards and guidance in green. We've got the ISO standards, the 41,011 that's coming. Um, what are you with us? The facility management definitions. We've got the British standards, the 8536, 8572s, etc. We must have an awareness of the wider sector impact and the influence of the wider sector organisations, the SIBs, the CIBs, the SIPs. What are they saying about FM? Do we agree with that? If we don't agree with it, shouldn't we actually be getting engaged with them and saying, hang on a minute, you've been saying this about FM, this is what we think? Maybe you're already involved with them. And then you've got the sector themes that sort of overlay all of this. And again, it's difficult to see on the slide, but sustainability, procurement, risk and resilience, health and safety, there's others that I could mention, that we absolutely have to have a fundamental understanding of, but also recognise, and this is the trick in our industry, I think, that there are other experts out there that can also support us in this. So this gives us our bedrock. Those of you with children with Minecraft who recognise the symbols. This is our bedrock, our foundation, in which we can start putting this onto Start putting that quality data. Remember I said about high quality data and the importance of important, uh, importance of, of real good quality, transparency, strategic view of, 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 of sound business management. And I don't think we have really able to pull all that together. But if we do, then we start being that trusted workplace provider. Or actually I should say advisor, really. Okay, so hopefully nobody thinks we're here in terms of technology. We are, of course, there. And by the way, this is cloud, um, sorry, the, you know, the cloud-based element to this. I don't think there's any doubt at all that five years' time, everything's going to be in the cloud. At the moment, it's all around, oh, well, data security and resilience. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you solve it? It solves so many of our problems around mobility and workplace management. And those of you like Harry Potter, some of you do think that basically this isn't really for me. I understand it. I get it. I understand other people might be doing it, but it's a, bit, it's a bit up in the clouds, really. I don't need to worry about that, because I've got too many things to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, if you've seen some of my presentation before, so I've used that slide before, but that's where we are. This actually exists. So we have flying cars. So we're in that world now. It's not coming. That's where we are. Are we ready for that? I'm not so sure we are. So get those basics right is what I'm saying in terms of the, fact, the, the, uh, the fundamentals of our, of, our, uh, of our sector. Hope you found that interesting. Thank you for listening. And um, I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions, maybe something like that, if you wish to.